Good evening, everybody. Uh, before I welcome you personally, I have the great honor uh, to present to you Professor Luc Durlo. Professor Luc Durlo, who was uh, our wonderful dean of the faculty for several years. And uh, I'm very pleased and honored that he agreed uh, to say a few words of welcome to all of you. Well, thank you, Vivian. I think the, the honor is all mine because I've always, uh, for the, during my tenure, I've always been able to admire what wonderful work is being done in the Institute of Jewish Studies in, uh, in our faculty. Um, and as you know, um, one of my concerns has, has always been to make sure that the, this is going to continue in the future. Now, I think over the past three years, we've made some important steps towards that. The uh, Institute was visited and to nobody's surprise, it got a very good and positive report with only minor remarks that are made just to make clear that people have been reading the documents, of course. Um, there's now a, also a plan for the, 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 the future five years. So uh, I think everything is on track. And as you know, uh, we're also in a position now to ensure that there will be uh, a proper succession procedure in the coming months and within the year, actually, um, that they will initiate a transitional phase for the Institute, whereby uh, Vivian will slowly let go of the helm of the Institute, uh, but certainly not, not all in one go. So I think... Um, and this is one of the things I'm, I'm proud of that I've been able to contribute to as, a, as dean, but it's certainly not my work alone, far from it, uh, that we're on the right track for the future. And that's a, a major concern that I've always had because the Institute is it's very important for our faculty. It's very important for the university. I think it's also very important to have something like that Institute in our uh, home city, Antwerp. So uh, it's, it's a step forward. And I'm happy to say that today to all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Diolo. This was indeed an important announcement uh, to all those who ha have been with us for many years and also the newcomers. Uh, the Institute is now, as I will uh, say in my opening words, uh, it is the 21st, the opening of the 21st academic year. Uh, and this is indeed a kind of crowning uh, of the efforts of uh, all of us and you who have been uh, building this over the years, uh, that there will be uh, indeed a professorship linked to the Institute. And while I still intend to uh, stay there for several years until uh, there will be indeed somebody ready uh, to succeed me, and uh, we will start this procedure, as Professor Durlo has just said, uh, looking for somebody who will first be just a, a professor linked to the Institute and later indeed uh, my successor. And I'm uh, very pleased and proud and grateful. So thank you very, very much. Um, it is uh, my very great pleasure to welcome you, uh, Professor Moshe Halbertal, dear colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this opening of the 21st academic year. I'm glad to see so many of you join us here today for this inaugural lecture, uh, which for the second time is, uh, has to be held online, but luckily by now the COVID situation allows for careful physical gatherings, a careful opening. Uh, so our fall program will be a mix of online lectures by renowned scholars from abroad and recorded or live streamed physical lectures in Antwerp as well. As next week, there will be a meeting uh, at the museum in Mechelen. Uh, I would like to start by thanking all of those. This has become a ritual and I can't believe that I'm doing this for the 21st uh, time indeed. I wish well to thank all those who have contributed to the development of the Institute. And I would like to thank the Ministry of the Flemish Community, the Department of Education, which fully finances our institution. 
we're most grateful to Rector Hermann van Hutem and indeed to Professor and former Dean Luc Diolo for providing strong and continuous support to the Institute, our board of directors and scientific and international advisory committees and Professor Halbertal is a member of this international advisory committee should be thanked for their valuable and much appreciated input and advice for our activities. I would also like to express my appreciation to the Institute's current postdoctoral researcher, Caroline Vermeule, and to the doctoral fellows, Sebastian Müngersdorf, Hans van Ness, and Adam Sachs, a Fulbright fellow from the University of Pennsylvania, who joined the Institute now in September with a joint PhD agreement. My sincere congratulations to Dr. Annelise Augustans, what a pleasure to say this, who so wonderfully defended her dissertation earlier this month. To my colleagues who offer courses in the context of the Institute, Dennis Barth, Paul Hjerbels, Aaron Malinsky, Karin Hofmeister, Kathleen Heises, Joachim Yeshaya, and Thomas Ernst, a warm thank you. And last but not least, I would like to thank our administrative coordinator, Jan Morens for doing such a wonderful job. He has over the past 10 years become the Institute's indispensable pillar. And I'm always very happy when I'm abroad and I mention Jan and everybody knows who Jan is. So thank you. The inaugural lecture traditionally marks the start of our weekly lecture series and our program for the semester includes lectures by national and international scholars who will as always present a wide range of topics within various disciplines of Jewish studies. Our fall program includes lectures and conferences on Paul Celan, on Austrian Jewish literature, on modern and contemporary art and Judaism, on the urban experience in Breslau during the Third Reich, on antisemitism, and a study day on Martin Heidegger and Jewish thought. You're all, of course, warmly invited to participate in all our activities, lectures, conferences, language courses, and courses on Jewish studies. You can find up-to-date information on the Institute's website, where you can also register for the lectures. Um, I am now pleased to introduce to you our guest speaker of today, first formally. Professor Moshe Halbertal is one of the foremost thinkers and scholars in Jewish studies. He is the Gross Professor at NYU Law School and the John and Golda Cohen Professor of Jewish Thought and Philosophy at the Hebrew University and a member of Israel's National Academy for Sciences and the Humanities. Among his books are Idolatry, co-authored with Avishai Magalit and People of the Book, Canon Meaning and Authority, both published by Harvard University Press. His books on Sacrifice, Maimonides, Life and Thought, and The Beginning of Politics, Power in the Biblical Book of Samuel, were published by Princeton University Press. And his latest book, Nachmanides, Law and Mysticism, was published by Yale University Press in September 2020. And as my New York son-in-law has witnessed, is read not only in libraries and classrooms, but in the subway and on park benches. I'm quoting. Moshe, we are honored that you are back in Antwerp. I only wish that I could say this not only virtually, but you are one of those exceptional scholars and speakers who make us forget that you're talking to us from a screen or rather that a screen and many thousand miles lie between you currently in New York, where you're teaching at NYU Law School and your audience in the four corners of the world is situated. I'm superstitious, so I don't count the times we had the pleasure to welcome you at the Institute, but I do want to invoke the variety of topics you talked about, from forgiveness to the meaning of a Jewish state from Job and Lament to Mourning in Maimonides. The title of today's lecture couldn't be more appealing and intriguing. And I dare say that the poetic rhythm and alliteration, law and love, only barely hides a millennial controversy that the scholar of religion, Jakob Taubes, described as die Streitfrage debate or dispute between Judentum and Christentum. 
Moshe, knowing this fragile object safely in your hands, I welcome you warmly and give you the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. It's an honor. Uh, I wish I was there in person. Uh, uh, as, as you know, I feel at home at, at the Institute and it's, it's a great honor and, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> and I hope to see you soon in person, all and, and in Antwerp. The topic of today is, um, is a broad topic. It's love and law in the Jewish tradition. Uh, that encompasses two questions, very broad questions, that I believe touch essential dimension of the Jewish tradition as a whole. First is the relationship between love and law. And the second is, what is exactly a religion of the law? After all, there is an element in Jew Jewish, Jewish religion which is a religion of the law. And uh, I will explore these two themes in this lecture, as I say, very broad thing within rabbinic Talmudic culture. And I hope that through that exploration, we're going to engage with fundamental questions, both of, of the nature of Jewish life and also the Jewish Christian debate, confrontation, dialogue. I, Judaism never produced <clears throat> an official theology. There is no set of dogmas. Every attempt at producing such a set of dogmas has failed. But the closest we have for a text that shapes Jewish religious life for every person is the Siddur, the prayer book. I think the closest to um, a common constitutive text that forms the religious relationship outside of just joint practice is the liturgy. And I, I want to start the question about law and love in a, in, a, in a certain liturgical moment. I would say the most explicit liturgical moment that addresses the question of God's love. It's a, it's a blessing that dates rather early, at least to the third century, I think before. And it's the second benediction before the recitation of Shema. I'm gonna recite it in Hebrew. It's a short text and then I, it has two versions. I'm gonna uh, recite the shorter version and then <clears throat> translate it. And the title of the, the, the beginning of the, um, of, of this blessing, Avatolam, with everlasting love, with everlasting love. Avatolam Bet Israel Amcha With everlasting love, have you loved your people, the house of Israel, God? And that's an explicit evocation of God's love to Israel. Torah mitzvot chukim mishpatim otanu limata. You have taught us Torah and commandments, decrees and laws. Therefore, Lord our God, when we lie down and when we rise up, we will speak of your decrees, rejoicing in the words of your Torah. <coughs> For they are our life and the length of our days. And then we will med med meditate day and night. May you never take away your love from us. Bless are you, Lord, who loves his people, Israel. That was the, the, the framing of this liturgical <coughs> text is love and the love of God. And it's very interesting that the love of God is expressed here in, in one major feature, which is the giving of the law, the giving of Torah, or if we want to be more accurate, the teaching of Torah, right? <clears throat> you taught us. Uh, so the ultimate expression, here's a, 
very powerful formulation. The axiomatic expression of God's love is the giving of the law, of the gift of the law. And I take this, uh, uh, I take this uh, liturgical powerful moment as the starting point of my reflections on our topic, beginning with asking a, a question, uh, which is why, is, why is it that the giving of the law is the ultimate act of God's love? I mean, we have different ways of configuring uh, um, God's love or the expressions of God's love. And here, boldly expresses this idea of giving of the law, which actually evokes this response of an ongoing engagement, day and night, uh, rejoicing in the law, in Torah. Why is it that, that, um, that the, the law is perceived as the ultimate gift of love? By the way, at the background, and I'm gonna come back to it, at the background is St. Paul, uh, not that this is a polemic, because those who constitute the liturgical sphere don't have to polemicize. But at the background is St. Paul who thinks, talks about the curse of the law. And we're going to get to that. Uh, but before, before entering that discussion, why is it that the law Torah is a gift? Uh, first, and I would say the most basic idea, is that what distinguishes and differentiates societies from one another is the qualities of their norms. I'm not talking about the written norms, but the actual norms in which people behave to one another, in which the basic structure of society is formed. Its procedures of punishment, its laws of inheritance, its structure of rights or not rights. We know that, uh, that the quality of political entities, states, communities, the way they distribute their wealth, it's all expressed in the actual structured habitual norms that govern those societies. This is why the law and fashioning the law as an ongoing precious activity is the ultimate form and gift of love. That's a, I would say, a basic understanding of what, what underlies this idea of the gift of the law. It's a divine action, a precious divine action, because it forms whom we are and what we are as societies. And we know the difference in dif the way different legal regimes affect qualities of societies in so many different forms. That's the first thing. Second, it's that law, and here I will evoke something very, I think, very deep in rabbinic culture. The law is a participatory activity. By that I mean, and it's interesting that the verb that is used here is you taught us. You didn't command, you didn't, you didn't give even. You taught us because law in the, in the rabbinic imagination is a participatory project. It's shaped by the giver and those who receive. And, and the rabbis have so many, so many statements concerning just that theme, right? There is a, a beautiful Talmudic statement in Tractat Makot where, where, um, where there is a liturgical practice that when the, law, the Torah is taken out of its, the ark, out of the Aaron, everybody stands. And the Talmud says, look at those, uh, ignorant people who stand before a Torah and don't stand before a scholar, while the Torah says thus and thus, but the scholar reinterpret the Torah to say thus and thus. Uh, and uh, uh, another statement, Chavivim divrei Torah mi divrei sofrim, divrei, sorry, Chavivim divrei sofrim mi divrei Torah, the words of the sages are, are more beloved or or <clears throat> than, than the words of Torah, because when a prophet comes, he has to give, he has to perform a miracle to validate the statement, the prophetic statement. But when an interpreter gives an argument, the power, the power and the authority of that argument lies in its very reasoning. It doesn't need any external performance. So law, uh, uh, law is a covenantal activity. 
There is a beautiful metaphor in Tana de Be'eliyahu, another Midrashic statement that, that describes the relationship between the written law and the oral law. By the oral law here, it means everything that comes out of intense engagement with Torah. Uh, and someone asks um, a certain rabbi, what is, what is preferable, the written law and the oral law? And he asks, what is preferable, wheat or bread? Um, the, the, transfer, the, the oral law is the transformation of the wheat, making it into a bread. So, so there is a, a participatory nature as a, as a gift. Uh, the law is a common project of, of God and the scholars, the God and the community, uh, in terms of expanding, creating, shaping, interpreting. That's the second dimension. The third one, um, no less important, is the law as a form of affirmation. And I, I, wanna understand, I wanna explain that in more detailed form because this is essential. Being a subject of the law is a form of attribution of worth, of status. Uh, being the subject of the law. Gadola Metsuvero say, greater is the one who's commended than the one who's not commended because the person who's commended is worthy of being commended, is worthy of carrying the, 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 the mitzvah. There is an affirmation. And here I want to get to our conversation with Paul. It's around the question of affirmation. Uh, we know it's as if, as if Paul is, is in dialogue with the idea that, that, that the law is a gift of love. And in the Galatians, I mean, there are many texts, I'm just quoting one of them in Galatians, in the letter to the Galatians, chapter three, verse 10, he says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under the curse. The law is a curse, it's not a gift. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of law of, of the law. Um, the law, and then he describes Christ redeem us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on the pole, etc. This is uh, the crucifixion as and God's other gift, at least in Paulinian sense, the gift of His Son. I, I would say, in some ways, the, the, the Christian Jewish debate is what is a, the ultimate of God's gift, his son or Torah? So you would say, well, the gift of the son redeemed us from the curse of the law. Uh, now, why is it? Why is it that the law would be a curse? And here Paul would say different arguments, I mean, different things, different lines of arguments. I would. Uh, the first one is to say, well, without, without law, there is no sin. That's a questionable argument. There could be a sin without law, right? Um, <clears throat> but, then, but then there is a maybe psychologically more astute idea um, expressed in Romans chapter 7, where he says, uh, verse 7, where he says, What shall we say then is the law sinful? Right? What's the relationship between law and sin? <clears throat> he describes that, that the, the, the prohibition evokes a temptation, right? He gives the example about the prohibition to covet, right? Uh, for I would not have known that coveting really was if, was if the law had not said you should not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the command that produced in me every kind of coveting, as if the barrier of the law itself evokes a temptation to transgress it. We didn't know coveting before we were prohibited from coveting. Well, it's another interesting argument, compelling to a certain degree. And then come, I, I go from the kind of lighter to the deeper, but the deeper argument, and, and then the deepest, is that um, the question of the law sets humans into a field of, into a domain of struggle that will, they were gonna always fail. 
uh, the struggle between the passion, the flesh and the law will lead to an ultimate failure, ultimate failure. And it's as, it, is if, it, it, it is as if given to us to fail. In a, and that's expressed in different moments of Colinian theology, that idea of, of uh, it's, like, it's like tax laws, you know, it's, 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 they're there to make you feel, to make you guilty because you can always be found guilty about avoiding tax. It's the trap. Uh, the law is there trapping you because we, you will never be able to fulfill it given your inclinations, passions and other things, it's a curse. But there is a deeper thing which addresses and emerges in, in uh, other aspects of at least Paulinian disciples, maybe not Paul himself, which, which gets to a deeper relationship between law and sin. And here we'll come to the kind of rabbinic response to this question. And it goes the following. It's the relationship between law, will, and sin, the will. Uh, in a certain trend of Christian theology, theology, Augustine, Luther, the way at least they read Paul, is that having a will itself, having an autonomous will itself is sinful because you have always the, the, the possibility to disobey. And therefore, your task is giving up your will, surrendering your will to grace for an act of faith. Law in that respect affirms the will. It affirms the will because it addresses the will. It says to you, you choose, right? I gave before you life and death. You made a choice. It kind of reaffirms what's sinful in us, which is having a will altogether, and surrender the will to the grace of God through act of faith is the ultimate redemption, redemption from law and from an ultimate sin. So there is a, here an established connection between sin and law in different modes of Paulinian thought. Now I just want to say a few thoughts about that and the question of the law and love, law is a gift, law is curse. Uh, something which is in all Paul's letters and in preparation for this uh, lecture, I reread them again. Um, and uh, Vivian, you mentioned in your starting remarks, Jakob Taubes is a Paulinian figure and an interpreter of Paul. And I reread his work and then Paul's like, there is one thing that is essential to the life of the law and missing, we, essential to the life of the law and law is love in rabbinic thought, which is completely missing in Paul. And this is why in some ways he missed the point, is the, question, is the concept of repentance. Uh, because the idea of repentance is love in the law. The idea of repentance assumes that there is going to be inadequate confrontation with the norms, but you can always start anew. There's always a form of correcting. You're not a prisoner of your past. Tshuva, repentance, forgiveness. Uh, it's not there to make you fail. It's there to accept you when you fail to start again. It's an over, over ongoing project. So it's not grace, it's repentance. And I would say, if, if I would dare to say, what is the ultimate difference in terms between Judaism and Christianity? I mean, these are all very broad generalizations, but some of them have power to catch something. Is that uh, if, if in this Paulinian trend, theological trend, having a will is sinful and therefore resignation of the will, surrender of the will to grace and faith is the ultimate answer. In the rabbinic thought concerning the relationship between law and love, the sin is the misdirection of the will. It's not having a will. It's the will not directing itself properly 
and and redemption or you might say correction is redirection of the will through repentance it's not giving up the will it's not surrendering the will um, and um, and you know it's interesting this is a, at the end of the tractat that deals with punishments Tratat Makot and Sanhedrin, uh, this is a famous rabbinic text because we repeat it in, in the liturgy, Ratzah Kadosh Baruch Hu Lezakot et Yisrael. God wanted to confer merit on Israel. Therefore, the Fich Achir Balaem Torah Mitzvot, he gave them plenty of laws um, uh, so they can, they can excel, they can make themselves worthy. Uh, so we have, we have, um, uh, uh, we have at the center of this question of law and love stands the relationship between law and affirmation. The law is perceived in, a rabbi, in, in the rabbinic world as a form of affirmation of the human. Uh, while understanding the possibility of, of failure through the, the loving acceptance of repentance and forgiveness. Um, so here's a question. Here's a question of what is the law and the ultimate gift of the law. I want to move from here to a theme which I think deeply related to the question of, uh, of love and law and give a more, I would say, calibrated uh, a sense of um, what is the religion of the law? And I want to contrast it with um, three other paradigms of religious sensibility, which the religion of the law stands, I would say, in tension with those paradigms. And by the way, those paradigms are living not only in other religions, but within Jewish life itself, because they're deeply deeply, deeply rooted in the religious experience. And they are, and, and in that respect, Jewish life will be always in tension because of its foundation as a religion of the law. The first typology, which is closer to the rabbinic world is what I would call the epic religion. Epic religion. By epic religion, I mean, uh, we might say biblical religion. It's a macro religion. It's the grand religion of history. Uh, God is manifested in historical, in the history, historical upheavals of exile and return and redemption. Uh, and the prophetic voice is the voice that guides and interprets that revelatory God, mo, uh, intervention of God in history. Now, uh, the life of the law is non-epic. It rejects the religion, the epic religion. Uh, there is a beautiful statement about messianism that I love that comes from one of, one of the great masters of the law, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. It says in Avotar Rabbi Natan, Rabbi Yochanan says, if you have a plant in your hand, and you're going to plant, and someone tells you, Messiah has come, first plant the plant and then go see if Messiah came. Right, anybody who knows uh, different texts about the urgency of the messianic call uh, understands that, 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 that kind of skepticism of the law towards, uh, towards the epic transformation through uh, uh, messianism. Um, it's uh, the religion of the law, I would say, is a micro religion. Uh, 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 heroism is expressed in the daily normative activity of, of, of bettering the world through the creation of law and adherence to the law. Uh, I would say the most important encounter with the epic imagination and the law that I know is a story I heard about, I heard and then confirmed in text about one of the great great rabbinic figures of the early 20th century, late 19th century, Reb Chaim Ibrisk. Uh, it, was, uh, it was in the middle of the First World War 
uh, where a few rabbis gathered and one of them said, so much bloodshed, so much killing. I hope at least it will usher the bringing of redemption. At least that, that, that chaos, that anarchy, that bloodshed will bring it. Now Reb Chaim was very upset and he said, we never heard, we never heard in all of Torah that, that messianism or redemption can override pikuach nefesh, saving of a life. We have never heard. And he said, if someone will tell me, sacrifice one life and Mashiach will come, I would say this is prohibited by the law. It's the, it's the understanding of the kind of the, the sober, I would say, not dry, not pathetic, but sober and deep response to the crushing, the way, the way epic religion crushes the individual and communities through the great promise that's soon to come. And then Reb Chaim says, I've never heard that, that uh, um, uh, Mashiach doche pikuach nefesh. We, we never heard it in our tradition. Messianism doesn't override the sanctity of life. So we have what I would call the epic religion as, as standing in tension with the religion of the law. The other mode of, uh, of religious imagination and paradigm which stands in tension with the religion of the law is what I call otherworldliness. By the way, that's a very deep pathos. That's very deep religious pathos or very deep religious instinct. Which, is, which perceives the here and now as a veil to overcome, that, that there is something transcendent, the kingdom of heaven, something above, something beyond, another world. It's kind of, you, you might say, the agnostic, uh, 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 with agnostic shade. Uh, and through Neoplatonism, it was just even, got stronger in the history of religion, right? Religion is about the flight from the world into the other realm, the real realm, uh, overcoming the illusion of the here and now. And uh, the life of the law, and that's something very powerful, is this worldly, and this will be always a tension within Jewish religious life. It draws you to the here and now. There is a there are some beautiful statements echoing this ten tension in, in rabbinic culture. Um, uh, here's a Mishnah in Tractat Avot that says, "Yafa she'achat shel Torah u'masim shel Tshuva u'masim tovim ba'olam azeh mikol chayah olam haba." One hour of Torah and good deeds in this world is is equal to all the world, all all otherworldly eternal life. Mikol chayah olam haba. Yafa she'achat as a, another, another rejection of otherworldliness coming through that sentiment of the grounded um, law directs you to this world, to the here and now, uh, to, to engage in, in, its, in, in somehow closing the gap between the ought and the is through law. Uh, uh, and, it's, um, and it resists this deep religious instincts of otherworldliness, right? It says, another statement in the Talmud in Sanhedrin says, uh, uh, there will come days that we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't wish those ways, uh, uh, days. Uh, this is a verse in Ecclesiastics in his pessimism talking about old age. And he says, there'll come days that you wouldn't wish them, you don't wish to be alive in them because they will be so sorrowful. And the rabbi said, yes, these are the world to come. This is Aulam Abba, the other world. You don't have Torah and commandments. You don't have the joy of, of mitzvot. So we have deep resistance uh, to what I would call the second religious paradigm which is the otherworldly and the, the, the religion of the law anchors, uh, anchors, directs the 
community into this kind of this worldly engagement. It's a kind of an anchoring that resists other worldliness in the tradition in a very deep way. By the way, the last, maybe the last, the last chapter of the guide, what makes the guide the Jewish work, you might say, is kind of the return from metaphysics to, to the world. Um, just, just imitating God's way in creation. The third paradigm, it's also very powerful as well in the history of religion, because you think about different religious structures, architectures, is what I would call uh, the religion of subjectivity, which is not the epic, neither the otherworldly, but it is uh, a certain deep idea uh, that, that God's field of revelation is within the interiority of the subject. It's through introspection into, your, into the inner citadel of the soul that you discover God because you discover the godly in you. You know, that has a long, long history in, in religious life, you know, from Augustine, but others as well in... in uh, and there is something counter-subjective in the life of the law. Uh, uh, it's not about interiority. It's not about the inner life. Um, it's... Uh, Everything that is of value has to be expressed externally in action, in behavior. Uh, with, by the way, a very interesting, ironic uh, take on intention, uh, inner work, uh, the life of the heart as the, as the ultimate religious realm. Uh, here's a statement I'm just quoting. I mean, there's so many quotations, but I'm quoting of the different things that I recall uh, about intention. You know, there are many discussions in the Talmud and in Al-Akhad, what's the relationship between action and intention, and especially when we come to prayer. And one of the, and the rabbis begin to confess about the failures in intending in prayer. And someone says, this is a, in the Talmud in Yerushalmi in Brachot, uh, one rabbi says, I try to intend in prayer and I find myself counting how much sheep do I have. And the other rabbi said, I try to intend in prayer. And I thought when we come before the, 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 the ruler, is that rabbi enter before me or I enter before him? But the other rabbi, which is the, the most uh, ironic statement, uh, says the following, you know, uh, one of the practices in prayer is then when you reach a certain moment in, 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 in prayer, you have to bow. Modim. And he says, I thank my spine that it knows automatically to bow when I reach Modim because my mind is somewhere else. The idea is, this is actually, it's very hard to conceive within a Protestant dominated world. Uh, but the idea is that what really matters when we evaluate our life is the things we do without intending. Our habits, our structures of norms, uh, and, the, and, the, and the realm of, of meaning is in action. In, in the way we act in the world. So it's very deep into the religious of the law that kind of resists um, subjectivity or interiority. So uh, if we wanna think, and I'm, I wanna put things together, if we wanna reflect on fundamental questions, and this is a lecture that doesn't deal with a particular theme, but rather with the large theme of the place of the law in the religious, in the Jewish religious imagination, we see very two very deep themes that run through the rabbinic culture. One is one is the one that I start with, which I think uh, uh, once a teacher of mine, a, a great professor, told me, "Avat Olam is the most Jewish blessing you have. There isn't any deeper Jewish blessing than everlasting love." Avat Olam of time. Right, you have loved us everlasting love. Why you gave us the Torah, you gave us the law. Torah mitzvot chukim u mishpatim otanu limato. 
And this is why we're going to ongoingly engage in it and rejoice in it. Uh, and that, that expression, which is kind of bold and, and not trivial in any sense, uh, is tied, as I said, to, to the, the preciousness and importance of the, the project of establishing norms as, as foundational to society, the, what I call the participatory uh, uh, dimension of covenantal participatory dimension of legal creation. Uh, and mainly then the, the question of affirmation of law. And here we come at home to, to the, you might say the, the Jewish Christian discussion, a certain, in a certain angle of it clearly, uh, uh, which is the relationship between law, love, and will. Or you might say from a Paulinian perspective, law, uh, grace, grace, faith, and the curse of will and law uh, as, a, as, a, as a tension. And then, and then I, I, I try to, I try to uh, reflect on, on the question which I think is fundamental, which is what is exactly the religion of the law? What is the source of sensitivity? Uh, that, that sensitivity that is so deeply um, um, expressed in, in, a certain, in, a, in a central form of Jewish life, countering what I would call three religious counter paradigms, the epic, the otherworldly, and the subjective. Again, uh, one thing I think which is interesting within Jewish tradition itself, and we can we, that can be explored in different ways of it, which is how, how religious traditions, how, how different moments in Jewish thought, Jewish life, uh, who were drawn to these other religious paradigms, be it the epic, the otherworldly, the subjective, they will always have to struggle with the counter paradigm of the of the religion of the law as a, as a paradigm. So I would, I would, I would stop my, uh, my, my lecture at this point. I think, I think, I hope I've touched uh, with something really fundamental on what I believe is fundamental uh, to the Jewish experience. Maybe, maybe, maybe good for a, an opening of the year. Uh, hopefully, because this is a subject that, that we can deal with so many angles, and and really thank you for the opportunity to to present to you my thinking about these issues. Moshe, thank you infinitely for a deep, powerful, clear, and uh, and fundamental lecture, indeed.